Okay, okay, okay. Uh, um, so let's continue. And uh, uh, we were looking at the uh, before we uh, left for lunch. And uh, again, this uh, is about all these uh, uh, similes about the shortcomings of the sensual world, yeah, the sensory, the uh, five senses, and all the objects of the five senses. And, and it's also the desire for those things about the, you know, how these things often are different from what you think they are. And uh, so these similes, I think, are very useful just to get a bit of balance in these things. Uh, yeah, it's, like, it's actually quite difficult sometimes to understand the uh, shortcomings of the story world because we are so close to it uh, and it is so important to us and the majority of people in the world, they are so attached to these things. They are so important to them. This is all life is about. And from the moment you wake up in the morning to the moment you go to bed at night, we are immersed. We are embedded in the sensory world. From the everything we know so from that, and finding something more profound actually is quite a, it's quite challenging. And that's why you need some of the special symphonies of the Buddha to get clarity about these things. So um, uh, let's. Um, see what happens uh, and see what the rest <coughs> of these similes actually what they uh, what they look like and how to reflect on these things in a uh, proper way um we are one simile brother like can we go back one simile please we are one simile too far uh, so if you can move back to the previous simile that would be great uh, that's it yeah that's great the, the, bla the blazing torch that's the one we want to be with the blazing torch a little bit down. So, uh, yeah, uh, the, the simile is a big bit down, the blazing grass torch the other, the other direction. Yeah, a bit more. Yeah, that's it. That's the one. That's where we want to be. Yeah. So, um, and so the Buddha says, he says, uh, suppose a person carrying a blazing grass torch was to walk against the wind. What do you think, soldier? If that person doesn't quickly let go of that blazing torch, wouldn't that burn their hand or arm or other limb, resulting in death or death like suffering for them? Yes, sir. And then uh, and I got some three dots there, but of course, then the black yeah? hat, and he says, uh, in the same way, yeah, a noble disciple reflects uh, with a simile of the grass torch. Uh, the Buddha has said that the sensual, sensual objects uh, give little gratification and much suffering and distress, uh, and they are all the more full of drawbacks. Uh, having truly seen this with right understanding, they reject the equanimity based on diversity uh, and develop only the equanimity based on unity. Uh, where all kinds of grasping to the world's material delights uh, cease without anything left over. Yeah, so again, this blaze simile of the blazing grass torch. Uh, so, what is the point of the simile? The point of the simile is that the blazing grass torch has certain benefits. Yeah, if you are at night, you can see where, where you walk if you need a light. <clears throat> so it has certain benefits. It gives you a certain degree of happiness, just like uh, sensual pleasures also give you a degree of happiness in exactly the same way. Yeah? Uh, but the problem is, if you take that, that blazing grass torch, even though it gives you a certain benefit, uh, if you use it in the wrong way, you have to use it in the right way. Yeah? Use it in the wrong way, and you walk against the way the benefits embers from that torch, they will come back and they will hit you, they will burn you up, burn clothes of your robe if you're a monk or a nun. And, and uh, of course, that will be very problematic. You might even die as a result of that fire. Uh, and in the same way, with the sensual pleasures of the world, we have to pick up those sensual objects in the right way. Yeah, we should live the sensual life. If we're going to live in the sensory world in which we have to, we have, a chance. have to learn to pick up the things in that world in the right way. 
And what is the right way of picking up those things? And what is understanding that there are problems with these things? Understanding, reminding ourselves of the impermanence, and reminding ourselves of how the things in the world outside of us always uh, is inherently unreliable. And if we attach too much to those things, uh, then we're going to burn ourselves to the sensory objects of the world is a bit like asking for suffering please let me suffer i will suffer I must suffer, and we are asking for trouble if we do that and that is what this is about so what we do that instead instead of <coughs> attaching too much to that we try to and these things as they actually are. We let go a little bit because of that understanding. And then we kind we sort of move, grasping a little bit to the spiritual path instead. Uh, grasping a little bit to kindness, uh, grasping a little bit to uh, compassion, to understanding, to peace, uh, grasping all of these beautiful things on the Buddhist path. Uh, we have to grasp something. Uh, we need something in this world to feel happy. But, but if we can find our happiness elsewhere, uh, we don't have to grasp quite so much uh, of the sensual objects in the world. And then we use the sensual world, sensual objects in the right way. We use them because we need certain things to survive. We need food to live, we need clothes, we need shelter, we need friends. Yeah, we don't, we, we, uh, even if we have a partner in life, we also recognize the importance of spiritual friendship and all of that. Uh, then we are kind of like we don't burn ourselves so much uh, because we understand the dangers in these particular things, uh, and we don't take that blazing grass torch against the wind and we hold it uh, uh, in the opposite direction, so we don't actually burn. So that is the idea here, yeah, not to attach too much to these things, uh, and we let them go slightly. Detaching. Is a very difficult thing to do. You cannot really do it uh, um, through an act of willpower. How can we detach from things in the world? Uh, and then there's two things that we have to do to be able to detach. And you may have probably understood this already from what we are saying here. Uh, one of the things that you have to do to be able to detach a little bit uh, is to contemplate the disadvantage, uh, contemplate the drawback, contemplate the danger in holding on to these things. Uh, and the other thing is that you need to find your happiness somewhere else. Everyone needs happiness in this life. We cannot live without some degree of happiness. It becomes just impossible and very unpleasant. Uh, so we uh, move somewhere else to find our happiness. And of course, that then becomes a spiritual path uh, where we find happiness. We find joy in doing the right thing, in living well. Uh, and then we create automatically kind of independence for the spiritual world uh, because we have another way another place uh, of finding meaning finding, uh, contentment or finding satisfaction and all of these kind of things uh, yeah sounds good doesn't it uh, so the map the thing then is just that we have to do things and uh, that is the hard part uh, but the theory is kind of fairly obvious i think what, what it is that we have to do uh, it's just having enough faith having enough confidence uh, uh, to put our minds to the task. And if we then put our minds to the task, guaranteed that we will succeed gradually, gradually, stage by stage, little bit by little bit. So let us go on to the next simile here. And this is the simile of the uh, glowing coals. Yeah, there's a, a famous simile. <clears throat> and the word says, suppose there was a pit of glowing coals, deeper than a man's height, full of glowing coals that neither flamed nor smoked. Then a person would come along who wants to live and doesn't want to die, who wants to be happy and recall oils from pain. The two strong men grab that person by the arms and drag that person towards that pit of glowing coals. Do you think council was a writhe, writhe and struggle to and fro? Yes, sir. What is that? For that person knows that if I fall into that pit of glowing coals, I will either die or I will have a, a death like suffering and really powerful suffering. And the same way that the world continues with the little dots there, in the same way, you know. 
the noble disciple reflects that with a simile of the long pit of gold, that has said that sensual pleasures give little gratification and much suffering and distress. They are all the more full of drawbacks. And when you see all of that, uh, all kinds of material, the world's material delights cease without anything left over. So this is the very challenging simile, but also very interesting. The idea of the sensory objects of the world, all, all the things that we like, they are compared to a glowing pit of coals. Yeah, it's kind of a, a, a kind of astonishing if you think of that. And uh, uh, you wonder why? How is it possible? How can you? You know? How can you? Uh, stop yourself to you see the um, uh, sensual objects in this way. It seems so different from how we normally think about the sensory objects of the world. Uh, yeah, and it's very strong here. Yeah, it's that you know when you come close to the glowing pit of clothes, you kind of try to get free. It's like someone is dragging you towards them. Yeah, you are trying to free yourself and run away because it is so painful when you get there. Uh, but that's not how we approach these things in life. Yeah, when we have a nice relationship or we have some nice belongings, we, we hold on to them, we rejoice in them. We don't try to get rid of them. Oh, no, go away, belongings, go away. <laughs> it is very different from that. Yeah, we, we can't, it's very hard to kind of fully understand what is going on here. So how are we to understand this? And um, one of the best to understand this uh, simile of the glowing pit of coals uh, is also also found in the sutta. It's found in the Majjhaya of Sutra number seventy-five, uh, called the Magandya Sutta, and it explains how this is to be understood. And I will, I always explain the simile uh, uh, in this way when I do these little reads, but I will do it one more time because I think it is very useful to understand this in the right way. Uh, and in this Magandya Sutta, uh, the Buddha is talking to a wanderer called Magandya. The wanderer, these are like the spiritual people in ancient India. And the Buddha asks Magandya, he asks him, well, how, uh, what, um, what, what, how do you practice? What do you do? And Magandya tells him that, well, I am one of those who indulge in sensual pleasures, yeah? This is the kind of way that he practiced spiritual life. It's kind of strange, isn't it? Indulging in sensual pleasures. That was how he practiced spiritual life. And the Buddha says, well, actually, spiritual pleasures are spiritual, um, not spiritual pleasures, uh, worldly pleasures. Uh, yeah, sensual pleasures, they are problematic. Yeah? And my Gandhian doesn't want to hear about it because he's, he's indulging in this. Uh, and then the Buddha tells the simile, the simile of the leper. Yeah, the leper someone who has leprosy, uh, you know, this very severe illness found in certain places around the world, like, like in India, they have lepers to the present day, where you have sores on your limbs, and sometimes your limbs get so, sores are so bad, limbs can fall off your body, like you lose part of your finger or something like that. And so the Buddha says to Magandya, he says, well, suppose they were a leper, and when you have all of these sores, these sores are very, very itchy and it's very difficult to deal with. And he, uh, the Buddha says to Magandhya, well, suppose there is a leper uh, and his sores are so itchy uh, that he goes to the charcoal pit. Yeah. And this is what we're seeing the long charcoal pit. Uh, and he goes to that and he puts his hands or his feet uh, over that charcoal pit uh, to burn, yeah, to cauterize or burn his hands uh, because his itching is so bad. Uh, and the Buddha says, well, that man, he would find a certain amount of satisfaction in burning his hand or burning his feet uh, because it will stop the itching. It will reduce the itching. So burning your hands actually seems pleasurable to a person who has leprosy. And the Buddha says to Magandhya, well, but suppose, Magandhya, suppose that this leper, uh, he was able to go to a doctor or a, a physician, uh, and he would say to the doctor, I have leprosy, can you please cure me? And the doctor will then cure him. And the Buddha says, Magandhya, well, if that leper was cured of his illness, cured of the leprosy, 
would he go back to that charcoal pit and still burn his hands or burn his feet in that charcoal pit? And Mandir says, of course not. That would be crazy to burn his hands or burn his feet in that charcoal pit if he was, if he was well, if he was okay. And then the Buddha asked him this question, well, uh, uh, you know, that, that charcoal pit, uh, and he asked him why? Well, because that charcoal pit is hot. It is unbearable. It is really difficult. It's really unpleasant to burn your hands in that charcoal pit. And then the Buddha asked him the question, well, is it only now that the charcoal pit is hot and burning and unpleasant? Was it also hot and burning and unpleasant when that man still had leprosy? Then Magandhya said, no, the charcoal pit was hot now and also before. But the problem is that before the, the, the leper, because of the distorted mind state that he was in, he felt as if what actually is painful, actually he experienced that as happiness. His mind was so distorted. Yeah? So the leper is faculties, his ability to experience reality is distorted by the fact of his illness. What actually is painful appears to be happy. And then the Buddha says, well, it is exactly the same with uh, uh, the person who is indulging in sensual pleasures. Uh, when you emerge from sensual pleasures, uh, when you go beyond that, uh, you realize that when you were craving for these things, uh, your mind was distorted. What actually is painful, actually what you thought was happiness, actually turns out to be painful. So this is um, very profound. Yeah, and you wonder how this is the case. The reason why it is the case, because that pain that we are talking about is the pain of craving. Yeah? Craving is said in the scriptures to be like a fire. It burns you. Yeah? This is the problem of craving. Yeah? What does it burn you? Because it is restless, it is agitated, it is something that grabs hold of the mind. It is an unpleasant state of affairs. When you have craving, you are separated from what you actually want. Yeah, this is the problem with a craving. And that separation from what you want, and that desire which drives you, makes you work, makes you act, makes you will to. Uh, achieve the thing that you want. Uh, that whole movement, uh, that whole restlessness of the mind uh, is actually painful when you understand it properly. Craving is a state of pain. And be because craving is a state of pain, then any time that sensual pleasures uh, give rise to that craving, well, at that time you are really in pain in a certain way. But to be able to understand that you have to step out uh, of the sensual desire in your life. You have to temporarily, temporarily enter a state of samadhi or samatha so you can understand that these movements of the mind actually are problematic and that they actually burn you inside. That burning inside is the burning of craving. Um, how does this actually work? And uh, I think one of the obvious cases where this works uh, and where it is most obvious is in the area of sexuality. Yeah, sexuality that is often can be a very powerful and strong kind of craving. Yeah. And that is an obvious area where and this craving is really actually burning you. And, uh, and uh, why that is actually quite problematic. But another place where you can think of this, it might be easy to understand, is, for example, in smoking. When you smoke a cigarette, and some of you may have smoked it, yeah, occasionally perhaps, so I don't know if you smoke regularly, but maybe you have tried to smoke at some point. Uh, and I remember when I was young, sometimes I would smoke when I would go to a party or something, and foolishly, yeah, like you do when you're young, you want to be cool or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is, and you say so you have a cigarette, and I remember doing that, and I, I was always terrible, yeah, you would cough and you would kind of, it was just absolutely horrible, this, the, the smoking business. Uh, and, uh, but the strange thing is, uh, when you meet someone who is a smoker, someone who craves for smoking, uh, for them it is one of the most wonderful things in the world is to be able to smoke. Wow, it is so nice, yeah, the cigarette. Uh, but the reality is that uh, the, the, that cigarette tastes exactly the same. It's still disgusting. Uh, it is still exactly the same way as it was in the beginning. Uh, 
But the reason why it tastes so nice is because it eliminates the craving. And the craving is so painful. It is so unpleasant. It is so problematic. It's the elimination of that craving, that is what makes that cigarette nice. And in the same way, with some of the strong cravings that we have in this life, a very large part of the pleasure is actually simply getting rid of the craving. Okay, so getting rid of the craving is part of the uh, pleasure of uh, uh, those sexual pleasure. And it's really crazy when you think about it. Yeah, we build up craving so that we can overcome craving yeah? because it almost gives us a sense of meaning. You have the craving first, uh, then you kind of act to get rid of that craving, and to get rid of the craving, you're happy. And then you, afterwards, you seek, seek the craving again because you seek that you seek the same thing in the world of sexual pleasure. And you seek that so you can overcome it again. And it kind of goes round and round like this craving, overcoming, craving, overcoming. The craving gives you this feeling of being in charge, of being a sense of self, the will exerting itself in the world. That's why we are actually craving very often. And then we act to satisfy the craving. And then the satisfaction of the craving is like a kind of happiness because we get rid of that desire which actually is pleasant, which actually is burning us inside. And if this is one of the reasons why when you become go a really long way on this path, when you become an anagami or arahant, uh, you say that you don't have any kind of sexuality anymore. Sexuality is entirely abandoned. Why? Because you cannot crave. And without any kind of craving, there is no sexuality. Sexuality only exists in the area, era of, area of craving. Otherwise, it cannot exist anymore. So that's why someone who is spiritually advanced, they don't really get into relationships anymore. Someone who is into relationship is not hasn't really has gone, you know, to the very end of the Buddhist path. I don't mean to say anything bad about relationships because uh, you know the end, early parts of the path it is not really a problem, but it is just a way of understanding the. And limitations of some of these things. Uh, and I think that can, can sometimes be useful. But anyway, so I hope you can make a little bit of sense of that simile. It is a bit rough, yeah? The charcoal pit, it can be kind of difficult to see what's going on there, but uh, I uh, uh, maybe a little bit of, it can be a little bit of help in the kind of moving towards the proper understanding of these things. So, so let us go on to the next uh, one. So this is the simile of the dream. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so suppose a person was to see delightful parks, woods and meadows and lotus ponds in a dream. But when they woke up, they couldn't see any of them, but they couldn't see them at all. In the same way, yeah, the Buddha has compared the essential pleasures to a dream, a dream state. And another beautiful simile, this simile is more easy to understand, yeah, because this simile is more um, related to how to our immediate understanding of the world. And you know, all know what dreams are like. Dreams can be very fancy and very beautiful and very wonderful. They can also be very unpleasant. It depends on how you dream or what it is about. Uh, but uh, of course, they are not really real. You can't grasp them. There's nothing there to hold on to. Uh, and and uh, our sensual world is like that. Uh, yeah, the ideas of the sensual world are far more powerful than the reality of the sensual world. Uh, the idea of getting certain possessions, getting a beautiful car. I remember one of the, the people at EDF. And I was looking for it, like BMWs. Yeah, you're looking for a BMW and you have this dream of getting this BMW. And then when you have it, maybe it isn't as exciting as you think. And then after giving the seminar, then we went outside and she was going to take me to the doctor or something because I was having some kind of illness. And of course, she was driving a, a BMW. <laughs> that was kind of kind of interesting. Yeah. So um, anyway, I, I felt a little bit, you know. But I don't know, I'm sure, you know, you, I, I don't know if you are here. I think maybe you are here. If you are here, I'm sure you understood what I'm trying to do. So uh, the ideas of these ideas of relationships, of houses, of the, 
the central objects of life, whatever it is, with BMWs or what, or what have you, yeah, all of these things are the dream is far more interesting than the reality. Yeah. In the dream, you think you will be satisfied. In the dream, you think it will give it will really be something really worthwhile in a profound way. Yeah. I don't know, you know, when you're young, you think about what your future is going to be like, yeah. and you never go beyond a certain point. It stops at a certain point when you are satisfied. You have a beautiful relationship, you have a you know nice wife or husband, wife or girlfriend, you have a nice house, and you have everything you need in the world, and you have a good status and all of these kind of things. Yeah. But, uh, you know, one of the things that I learned from Ajahn Brahm is one of those very powerful contemplators. This is the, called the and then what contemplation. And then what? So when you think about the dream, you know, the dream of that relationship, for example, you get a relationship and maybe the person is a wonderful person and maybe you have a really nice time together. Sometimes you can see husband and wives who actually have really, really nice relationships. So, yeah? It is not that all relationships are bad. It is not that all relationships are arguments. Uh, sometimes you can find a good relationship, uh, and sometimes you don't. Uh, and, and I think more often than not, the relationship is not super duper great. It's kind of ordinary. That's what happens with most people, I think. Yeah. But uh, you know, uh, what happens after you get into that relationship? Uh, what happens beyond that? And very often, it has been just you know, it goes into the ordinary. Which is, you know, hanging out together, do, doing things together, and uh, as you ask, and then what, and then what, eventually must come the parting of that relationship, uh, whether the person leaves you, uh, whether they die, whether you die, whatever happens, uh, they will always have to part. So, asking, and then what? Uh, idea by asking the uh, question, uh, you actually go beyond that dream, you go beyond the fantasy, the fantasy of some kind of sensual pleasure being really beautiful, being really marvelous, being something that is satisfactory. And you know that down the track must come separation, down the track must come the disappointment uh, of the person not really being as wonderful as you thought they were. Yeah, very often when we fall in love with somebody, we only see part part of that person, that person also has other sides, so there's going to be downsides to them as well. And then is the same questions as asking at the end of the movie, the end of the movie when everything, the, uh, you know, the prince gets the princess and they live happily ever after. No, instead you should ask them what. Uh, what happens after the cowboy round, rides into the sunset with, the, with his girlfriend? Well, after that, starts ordinary life, the boring things of ordinary life, uh, the dish, dishes that have to be uh, washed, the nappies that have to be changed on children, uh, all the work that you have to do when you go to work, all those ordinary things start. Uh, so you always use the and then what uh, to kind of take some of the uh, glory, some of the luster out of those sensual pleasures that we think are so important to us. So um, um, remember the, the, the dream, the ideas of the things in the world. When I get that promotion, uh, when I get that status, when I finish my education, uh, when I have this beautiful house, whatever it is, uh, they're always going to be limited. Uh, they're always going to be different uh, from what you think they are. Uh, and I always like to think of myself because I, when I was young, I was no different from everyone else. Uh, I thought I was going to have you know, a, a nice girlfriend and a big house. And then, uh, you know, of course, just, just as conceited as young people are. Uh, and of course, I ended up like this. Yeah, the way I, I'm here now with a kind of funny clothes and a, a short cut. Uh, and that's how I, you know, became a monk instead. So that, all that fantasy was really completely wasted and really silly. And it turned out to be very, very different uh, from what actually um, uh, the fantasies uh, were suggesting to me. Uh, so try the and then what uh, idea and see how that kind of takes you out of some of these fantasies of the world. Uh, let's move on to the next simile. The next simile, another important uh, simile in my opinion. Uh, this is the uh, simile of the borrowed goods. Uh, suppose a man had borrowed some goods, uh, a gentleman's carriage, fine jeweled earrings, uh, and proceeded and surrounded by these hypocrites. 
he proceeded to the movement of apana. Yeah, so he is an apana is the approach to this person in apana. That's why he's bringing up apana. When people saw him, they would say, this must be a wealthy man, for that is how the wealthy enjoy their wealth. But when the old boy would take back their things, what do you think? Would that be enough for that man to get upset? Yes, sir. Why is that? Because the owners took back their things. This is the idea of, uh, uh, you know, we tend to treat things in the world that are just borrowed. We tend to treat them as if they are ours. Yeah, this is what is happening here. And then in the meantime, you uh, get attached to it. Yeah, you think that this people say, wow, look at that man. He is wealthy. This is how they enjoy their wealth. And because other people look up to you and they praise you for being wealthy and all these things, you get attached to that idea. And then someone comes and they take away those things from you. And then, of course, you're going to be upset. And our life, and this is a, one of those very simple contemplations you can do, uh, is to remember that everything in your life is borrowed. Uh, everything in your life is temporary. Uh, it feels as if these things are ours. Uh, it feels as if this is my BMW. Yay! <laughs> Hooray for my BMW. This is my house. This is my husband, my wife, my girlfriend, my boyfriend. I own this person. They are mine. And they cannot mess around because I want to control what they are like and what they do in their life. And, and all of these things, this is my status. This is my education. This is uh, my uh, whatever it is in this life that we hold on to. This is my gender. This is etc., etc., etc. This is my culture. Uh, and all of these things we hold on to. Uh, the problem is that all of these things, even though they feel like they are ours, that we are in charge. If somebody steals, they would protect. Why? Because we think they're ours. But the reality is that only last so long. They will only be here for a while, and then nature will come and take it back. And sometimes that happens during life. Sometimes it happens when we pass away, when we die. That is when all these things will have to go. Yeah, even your status, even your uh, understanding, even your uh, ideas about who you are, and all these ideas about who we are are also connected to this world somehow. So even those ideas too uh, are going to have to disappear here when you have So everything in this world is borrowed. Uh, we only have it for a while. It's not really ours. It belongs to nature. Nature will come and take it back uh, when the time is right. Uh, this is the right way of thinking about the goods that we think we own in this world. And what does that do to you if you know that everything is borrowed? Well, imagine you are renting an apartment. Yeah, you're going to stay in an apartment for a couple of months. You are renting it. How do you treat that apartment? What is the difference between being the owner and being the person who rents? Well, the difference is that the owner has a much more interest in that apartment. Uh, yeah? The owner might uh, make it really nice, spend a lot of money on it because you know, the owner will have it in the long term. Uh, whereas if you rent an apartment only for a short term, you look after it because you know it is right to look after it. Uh, but you don't spend an excessive amount of time dealing with the apartment, making it just right. Uh, because you know, soon enough, uh, you're going to have to leave again. Uh, you don't attach too much to that apartment uh, because you know you're going to have to give it up again in the future. Uh. And this is the same thing with life. All of the things around us, uh, they are borrowed. Uh, yeah? Remember that the things that you own in life, start looking at them as borrowed goods. Uh. Start looking at your, uh, even the, your family members and your friends as borrowed friends and borrowed family members. Uh, we have them for a while, and then we're going to have to say goodbye. And when you think about everything in your life like that, uh, think about your education as a borrowed good. Uh, think about your status in society, whatever that is, uh, as a borrowed good. Uh, think about your intelligence. If you think you are intelligent, uh, that too is a kind of borrowed good. Uh, you have it for a while, uh, and it's gone again. And when you do that, it's kind of your attitude to all these things. Uh, it doesn't mean that you become careless. It doesn't mean that you don't look after them. You look after them in a different way. 
you become less controlling. You can become more at ease with this thing, just being around you. You are still kind, you're still caring because you know that kindness and caring is the right way to live. But your kindness and caring is more pure. It is more pure because you don't attach so much to the things around you. And um, this is where you start asking yourself the question, well, this, if all of these things in life are borrowed goods, uh, yeah, what is it that is not borrowed? Is there anything which is not borrowed? Uh, and this is what I was talking about yesterday, what the Buddha says that you are the owner of only one thing in this world. Uh, and the Buddha says the thing that you are the owner of is your karma, your actions, uh, the mind that you build up through living well, through doing acts of kindness, through being generous, through being caring, and all of these kinds of things, uh, that brightness inside, that is what you become an owner of. Uh, yeah? That is what really matters in your life. Uh, because that you do bring with you into the future. Even if you pass away into your future existence, uh, it is that brightness of the mind that you take with you beyond your grave uh, and into that future. Uh, and so we think about life in a different way. Uh, Instead of investing time in purchasing things and succeeding in this world, understand that that success, even if we have it, even if we do succeed, it is only so temporary. What is the point in putting in so much effort in success in this world when we know it is only borrowed, it's only going to be there for a short time? Instead, we put the effort into that which we own, which is having a beautiful mind. What does that mean? It means that we focus on the process, how we do things, not on the outcomes. We understand that the outcomes are inherently flawed because they are borrowed. They will only last for so long. But we understand that if we do the process in the right way, if we treat people well as we go along and trying to succeed, if we act from kindness, from compassion, from care, from doing things in the right way, then we are going to have this long-term happiness, uh, this one thing that we own in a greater sense, uh, and the beauty of our own mind, the beauty of our own conduct, uh, the happiness that we build up inside, that we will then be able to take with us into the future. Uh, so on the surface, it may not look all that different. Uh, we're still living largely in the same way. Yeah, we still have uh, the same job, perhaps, the same family, the same relationships, the same friends. Uh, but uh, if you take a step back, you'll see that a person like this, uh, they, uh, even though on the surface everything looks the same, uh, the way they are going about their business, the way they're dealing with their friends, uh, that has changed. Uh, they have become more caring uh, and more, a more understanding person. Uh, and that is really what we should be looking for in this life. Uh, and then you are on the right track. Yeah. It is quite difficult to do. Yeah? It's very hard to do because in our world, uh, there's always a push to succeed and all the companies will try to push us. Uh, so we have to try to stand our ground. We have to try to say, I know what is really important in my life uh, and I'm not going to allow myself to be pushed around too much. Uh, I'm always going to prioritize the process, uh, prioritize the kind, prioritize the treating of the people in the right way. I'm trying to prioritize the bottom line because the bottom line at the end of the day will be gone. It is borrowed goods. It doesn't matter so much. And even if I lose my job, well, maybe it is a good thing if you lose your job because sometimes the job is just too pushy. And maybe what you really need to do is to downsize a little bit and to do something else, which is more, you can be more at ease and you can live life in a more appropriate way for your long term happiness and your long term. Uh, prosperity. That is what really matters. Uh, so remember the idea of the bond goods. Yeah, it is very uh, beautiful. The problem is that we tend to be trapped into this one life. Uh, we think this one life is all there is. Uh, once you expand your horizon, yeah, remember one of the kind of the magnific magnificent things that you can sometimes see, you can see it on YouTube, uh, you can see people who had a glimpse of the future, what happens after you die. Uh, I don't know if you have heard about this uh, uh, lady. Uh, she was from Singapore originally, then she moved to Hong Kong. Uh, she was of Indian background, Anita Murdani. And many of you probably heard of her because she's quite well known. She wrote a book about her experiences when she 
almost died. And yeah, she had a very powerful near death experience and all of that. And uh, uh, you know, sometimes it's worthwhile listening to these people because they give you a glimpse of what it is like to have this bigger picture instead of just being narrowly focused on this one life, it opens up this panorama, this larger view of reality, and we start to see what is really, what is really important. Uh, people like Anita Mojani, she will tell you straight away that all of these things in this world are relevant. Uh, yeah? What matters is that we have love, that we have compassion, that we have understanding, that we have kindness. Uh, because once you withdraw from this world and you see that bigger picture, we see what makes you happy in the long run, what really is important. Uh, that is the right way to live. Yeah. So it is kind of uh, beautiful in this sense. Uh, and sometimes we, we can listen to these kind of people to give us that feeling for what it means uh, to go on from life to life, from one to the next one, uh, and move on and understand that bigger picture. There are a lot of people in this world who have had that glimpse, that long glimpse of reality. Uh, understanding samsara, understanding the idea of rebirth in a more profound sense. Uh, and that is when you understand this idea of borrowed goods, uh, yeah, when that happens. Uh, so um, that, is, uh, uh, that is the simile of uh, borrowed goods. Uh, so let us move on to the last of the similes. Uh, this is the simile of the forest grove, yeah? And uh, this is how it goes. Suppose there was a dark forest grove, not far from a town or village, and there was a tree laden with fruit, and yet none of the fruit had fallen to the ground. And along came a man in need of fruit, wandering in search of fruit, having plunged deep into the forest grove, and they would, uh, he would, uh, a person, they would see that tree laden with fruit. And they would think uh, that tree is laden with fruit, uh, yet none of the fruit has fallen to the ground. Uh, but I know how to climb a tree. Why don't I climb the tree, eat as much as I like, then fill my pouch? Uh, and that is what that person would do. And along would come a second person in need of fruit, one in search of fruit, and tracks. Uh, Having plunged deep into the forest grove, they would see that tree laden with fruit. They would think that tree is laden with fruit, yet none of the fruit has fallen to the ground. But I don't know how to climb a tree. Why don't I chop this tree down at the root, eat as much, much as I like, and then fill my pouch? And so they would chop that tree down at the root. Um, And so they chop that tree at the root. And what do you think, householder? That first person who climbed the tree doesn't quickly come down. When the tree fell, wouldn't they break their hand or arm or other limb, resulting in death or deadly suffering for them? Yes, sir. In the same way, a nobleness reflects us with a simile of the fruit tree. The Buddha said that sensual objects give little gratification and much suffering, yeah? and the distress and much distress, uh, and they are all the more full of drawbacks. Having fully seen this with the right understanding, they reject the equanimity based on diversity uh, and develop only the equanimity based on unity, where all kinds of grasping to the world's material delights cease without anything left over. So that is the famous, another famous simile that uh, uh, fruit eaten with fruit, uh, yeah? And uh, you can imagine here that the tree laden with fruit, yeah, in the forest grove. Uh, the grove is like samsara, you're wandering around, yeah, looking for trees laden with fruit. These are the things you're trying to achieve in your life, yeah? Finding a nice home, finding a nice partner, finding education, all this to achieve in our life. Yeah, this is like the trees. We're wandering around in samsara, trying to find a tree that is full of beautiful things. Uh, this is kind of the purpose uh, behind this. Uh, 
And then one day, maybe we find that perfect person we want to uh, <clears throat> get married with or have as our boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever it is. And then you climb that tree. Yeah, you climb, in other words, you get married or whatever. And then as you climb that tree here, you start enjoying the result of that tree. Yeah, you climb, you eat those beautiful mangoes at the top of that tree here. And you really enjoy those mangoes. And as you enjoy, as you indulge in those sensual pleasures uh, that you have in your uh, life or in your household or whatever it is, uh, as you do that, you lose track of what really matters. Uh, it just lead you to become heedless. Uh, yeah, this is like uh, we talk about being intoxicated in the world, and very often intoxication, of course, drinking alcohol and these things. Uh, but the reality is that sexual pleasures too make us intoxicated. Uh, why? Well, because when we are indulging in sexual pleasures, uh, when we are attached to the things of the world, uh, we have a vested interest. That interest uh, does not enable us to see things as they actually are. We are distorted. Uh, we are intoxicated by those fruit in the tree. We are uh, eating those things. We are devouring them. We are swallowing it all down. And as we do that, uh, we stop to see the danger. We forget about the danger in these things. Uh, we forget that one day these things can no longer last. One day they will be taken away from us. Uh, and that is the problem. And that um, impermanence is in this particular simile, it is symbolized by the man who comes along with an axe. He comes with an axe and he's about to chop down the tree. Yeah, that is kind of the impermanence. You were no longer able to devour those sensual objects, those sensual pleasures, because impermanence comes and takes it away from you. And unless you come down from that tree very quickly, unless you gain back your senses again, unless you lose your intoxication and see the reality for what it actually is, uh, uh, that tree will fall over and will suffer enormously as a consequence. Uh, in the same way, the Buddha says that if we in are intoxicated by the world, uh, we forget the reality of uh, uh, these problems, uh, then very often we end up doing bad things in the name pleasures so, yeah in your pursuit of a partner in life you may do bad things to other people who are rivals uh, in that pursuit in the your pursuit of uh, a success in your company uh, you may do things bad things against th those people who are rivals in that company who try to also to kind of really favor with the boss or whatever it is uh, and uh, so you do end up doing bad things uh, when we are intoxicated by the sensual world uh, one of the problems is that we put the sensual pleasures so high on the pedestal and that putting the sensual pleasures on the pedestal means that we are willing to do even bad things to achieve those pleasures in life. And of course, what we are really doing is that we are pursuing short-term happiness and long-term misery. That is what that really is about. We're getting things the wrong way around. And those short-term pleasures that we are seeking and that we are prioritizing, they are so uncertain. They are so, un so unreliable. And before you know, they are gone. And then all you have left is the long-term suffering that you have created through your own bad actions. So we have to get our priorities right. We have to understand what really matters in life. Yeah? All of this short-term stuff that we are pursuing all the time that doesn't really matter, that intoxicates us, that actually makes us sick, and we forget what really matters in the long run. Huh? So instead of all of that, develop a heart of kindness, of care, of understanding, of compassion for the world, uh, and show a sense of love and appreciation to the people around you. Uh, never take them for granted, uh, never do things that are bad against them. Why? Because you're dragging yourself down. Uh, you're falling out of that tree. Someone is coming with an axe and chopping it down. Uh, who is that person who is chopping it down? It's just nature. Eh? Nature comes along and chops down its own because nature, to what nature does, eh? nature is actually impermanence itself. So remember that. Yeah, be kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself. And the way to do that is to prioritize the right things about that. And as you do that, then you gain something truly worthwhile, something that actually will make a big difference in the long run.
So I should maybe also add here that you know one of the the, the opposite of uh, this uh, fruit tree, and uh, it is actually something found in the sutras, and uh, this is the moving out of that jungle, moving out of that grove, yeah, where we are stuck. Uh, there are essential pleasures all the way around us. We can't really see very far. Uh, we are lacking a sense of oversight. Uh, and we have no clarity about what is going on around us. Uh, so the opposite of that is if you carry on through that jungle, uh, and one day as you carry through that jungle, you come to a hill, you come to a mountain, you come to a pyramid. Uh, and as you climb that mountain, as you climb that pyramid, uh, you actually get out of the jungle. Uh, and when you get out of the jungle, finally you stand above the canopy, above all the trees. And for the first time in life, you're able to see what is actually going on. We can see all the trees in relationship with each other. We can see the paths, you can see the rivers, you can see the lines. And you can see the end point of all of this jungle underneath you. For the first time, you understand what is going on. And uh, there's a symbol like this in the suttas, not here, but somewhere else, uh, where it talks about two friends, and two friends, uh, they come to a, a small mountain or a hill, and one friend says to the other one, let's go to the top of this hill. Uh, yeah, and the friend says, no, I couldn't be bothered, I'm too lazy to go to the top of the hill, you go. And so the other friend, he goes to the top, uh, and when he goes to the top, he looks out and he says, wow, this is amazing, the kind of view you can have. You wouldn't believe it, the view that is available up here. You can see all the fields, all the roads around, all the villages, and everything can be seen from the top of the mountain. And the friend from the bottom said, nah, I don't believe you. It's just all nonsense. I, you know, whatever you say, I don't, I don't believe about it. We get lost or whatever he said, being a bit rude uh, at the bottom of the mountain there. And then uh, the friend at the top, he gets a bit exasperated. Uh, so he comes down to the bottom uh, and he grabs his friend by the arm, pulls him up to the top of the mountain. Yeah. And this friend grabs him by the arm. That's like the Buddha, the Buddha who takes us yeah, and says, come, look, there's something powerful here. There's something to be gained, the happiness that is far beyond the ordinary happiness of human beings. Do you want to see water? Okay, okay. And so he comes and pulls you up the mountain. Uh, well, you see exactly the same thing. You see also the beautiful views, the beautiful sights, the villages, the rivers, the roads, the meadows, and all of these things. And then the first friend, he says, to him, he says, well, why do you say at the bottom of the mountain that you didn't see that these things aren't there? Why do you dismiss this? Yeah, when actually now you are saying it is there. And uh, the friend says, well, because when I was brought of the mountain, I was blocked by this very mountain itself. And in this simile, the mountain is a simile for the five hindrances. And as I mentioned before, the main factor of these five hindrances is the desire for sensual pleasures, yet karma chanda, desire for the sensory object, that is the main hindrance. So when you pull someone to the top of the mountain, it is like you are emerging from the five hindrances, especially you are emerging from sensory desire itself. And when you come to the top of the mountain, when you have elevated yourself above the sensual pleasures of the world, only then can you understand what the sensual pleasures are about, what the problem is, why these things are problematic. Only then can you see the villages, can you see the fields, can you see the meadows, the rivers, and, and all of these kind of things. And you can understand the whole picture, the bigger picture of what is going on. So it's a beautiful simile for the idea of samadhi. Samadhi, when we reach a state of samadhi, we elevate the mind. We make the mind beautiful and brighter. We make the mind float above, outside, beyond the sensory world. And we understand the sensory world for the first time. Why? Because we have given up that world. And when you give up that world, only then can you really understand what it is like. It's like your mind soaring above everything. You get the bird's eye view, and you get the bird's eye view, you look down upon that world, and for the first time, you understand what that world really is about. 
It is problematic. It is impermanent. It is full of craving. And because it is full of craving, it never really gives any real satisfaction at all. But now that you have withdrawn your mind from that world, uh, you have seen the end of craving for those sensory objects. Uh, for the first time, are you able to understand what uh, freedom from that world actually means? And of course, it is extraordinarily beautiful. It is an extraordinarily happy thing. And for those of you who have had some good meditations, I'm sure many of you will sometimes have had some nice meditations, uh, you will understand a little bit of what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah. Because in that happiness of meditation, in that joy that you sometimes get, that peace you can find in meditation, you're starting to understand what spiritual happiness really means. And if you investigate that spiritual happiness, you will see that it is quite different from the happiness of the world. It is peaceful. It is satisfying in a very deep sense. It is satisfying in a sense that the Pleasures of the world never can be satisfying. Yet. The pleasures of the world just keep you running on and on and on. There's no end to that running. Yet. For the satisfaction of the mind, that is a satisfaction that stops. It comes to an end. It is satisfying in a profound way, in a deep way, where craving ends and you actually start to discover the very meaning of life itself. So if you have a little bit of that happiness in your life, a little bit of that joy sometimes in meditation. Remember, there's far, far more to be had. Yeah, as you reflect, as you practice this path in the right way, there's just more and more and more of these beautiful qualities. And that is the path. That is the power of this path. Yeah, that it actually gives you something truly worthwhile at the end of the day, while giving up all the problems of the world at the same time. Isn't that great? Isn't that kind of wonderful and marvelous, giving up all the problems of the world, uh, all the problems in life, uh, and at the same time, something that is truly satisfying, truly happy, truly meaningful in your life. Uh, it's kind of a double benefit. Uh. So, there you are. Uh, and uh, that is the uh, similes of the uh, Potalia Sutta. Uh, one of my, one of the great suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya, uh, which kind of sets out and makes it very clear and the limits uh, of uh, the sensual pleasures of the world. Uh, so I think it is a good point to stop and to have a short break. Let's have a break for about 15 minutes till about 1.45, uh, yeah? And we'll see you back again at 1.45. Uh.